Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think we need much motivation, but I'm going to give you slightly more motivation why we might care about uncertainty. It was interesting that Gus mentioned that was in your, in your original Green Book work. Olivia Blanchard actually wrote a piece. So I started working on this. I started working on my PhD back in like the late 90s. And I guess I was talking to my wife the other day and said, I was like really lucky. I started working on this and then uncertainty too. Un lucky for me, I guess. Unlucky for everyone else. But back. The, the big event, in some ways, is when I was doing my PhD, 9-11 was seen as the big uncertainty shock, but it's nothing in comparison to basically the Great Recession. So Olivia Blanchard, many people claim that a lot of the 08-09 drop was due to uncertainty. I doubt the majority of it was, you know, I think financial conditions, but I think it was a contributing factor. There's a whole debate in the US, you probably missed living over here, but between uh, particularly Republicans actually beating up Obama administration, claiming that policy uncertainty was killing the recovery. Uh, more recently, there's Trump and, of course, in the UK, you know, the B word. So uh, media cares a lot about it. If you survey businesses, here's like a survey from 2012, they always claim and, you know, say that uncertainty is a big factor. It's hard to tell whether they mean basically the first moment, as in the slow demand, or the second moment, the high uncertainty, but my suspicion is some combination of both. Um, I think for some people, the best evidence for the uncertainty is important. So people like John Taylor or John Cochran, my, re my Republican colleagues in Stanford, is Paul Krugman thinks it's not. So there's, there's a bunch of people that def define themselves as the exact opposite of Paul Krugman. Uh, Paul Krugman has written quite a lot about uncertainty in his uh, piece in the New York Times. He was initially started off being surprisingly polite for Paul Krugman. Uh, Asymmetric varieties of uncertainty. Then he, you know, he's more Krugman esque. Culture of fraud, he's claiming we can't measure uncertainty, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Therefore, uh, you know, I guess what gets measured gets managed. And if you can't measure it, I, I wasn't quite clear where this was heading. Uh, the uncertainty scam, another bad story bites the dust, uncertainty of the OECD, what they say versus what they mean. I think this is it. No, phony fear. It just goes on and on. So eventually, Paul Krugman got bored. But I want to kind of focus on his issue. Uh, which is how do we measure uncertainty? I'm just going to, you know, following the theme from today, actually, hopefully, I'm not going to put up a single equation. Uh, I think I have maybe one regression table. I was just going to pull the gist of it, just a very practical thing on how we'd actually go about measuring uncertainty given where we are. So there are three types of measures I've used and I think are quite common. The first is stock market volatility. So this is a graph of the VIX. If you don't know what it is, it's the one month ahead implied volatility in the S&P 500 is basically a market-based measure of what you expect stock market volatility to be over the next month. It turns out that that's highly correlated to what it is now. So one measure of uncertainty is just basically stock market volatility. Do stock markets bounce up and down a lot? Here it's from 1990 onwards. Um, it kind of looks reasonable. You can see stock market volatility tends to go up in recessions. It also went up. There's a couple of spikes, 97, 98. That's the long-term financial cap. L L what was it? LTCM, Russia, and the Asian default crisis. The thing that I think is slightly a problem for me for stock market volatility is there's no Trump point. So everyone kind of <laughs> would think Trump has increased uncertainty in the US. I certainly sense it living over there, but he doesn't show up. So. Stock market volatility is a way to measure uncertainty. The pros is it's daily, and it's available real time. Having talked a lot to policymakers, having something that's available now is really useful. So having a measure of uncertainty that comes in with a two-year lag is kind of problematic. It goes back to 1990. I used this in my PhD. This was like the primary measure I started off using 25 years ago or 20 years ago. The cons is, you know, it's a measure of uncertainty. It's mainly recessions, and it focuses a lot on the financial crisis. So where's Trump? So that's one type of measure. I'm not going to talk much more about it. It's, it's kind of great, the, the kind of classical measure. The second is newspapers. It was interesting that Dan mentioned text. I, you know, for, for academics out there, I see a huge explosion in the US of people doing text to data. I'm not sure if there are any grad students here, but I'm kind of encouraging the grad students in Stanford to learn uh, you know, coding and how to actually scrape text and go into data is just totally taking off. For, for the reasons that Dan actually highlighted exactly, that A, you can get historical stuff, you can do much more nuanced stuff, it's just like exploding. So I'd say the Stanford PhD students probably you know, encroaching a call to them and now doing work around text to data. So I was part of a group with Scott Baker, who's in fact my PhD student, uh, and Steve Davis, trying to use newspapers to measure policy uncertainty. And we published a paper in 2016 and uh, like all you know, uh, good economists, we put our data on, on, online. We have a website, and lots of people use it. 
This came about from something that Steve Davis and I were talking about, I don't know, 15 years ago, about policy uncertainty around the whole Republican-Democrat debate and how could we measure it. And it was actually not obvious how you'd measure policy uncertainty. We started thinking about using newspapers. So I'll show you what we do. Uh, so for the US, and I'll show you the UK index, for the US, we took the 10 major US newspapers, which is these, I mean, you've probably heard of all of them, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, um, and we search for the number of articles that contain economic or economy uh, and some policy word, regulation, deficit, Federal Reserve, Congress, legislation, and White House, and uh, uncertainty or uncertain. So on policy, you may think, why don't we look for the word policy? Turns out the word policy is not a good word to search for, because there's lots of things about insurance policy, which is not government policy, or there's a great one about the Green Bay Packers fourth down rush attack policy. So there's lots of things. So it turns out those are, you know, this like you're minimizing type one and type two error. So if there's something about serious government policy, it's likely to mention one of those words. So if a newspaper mentioned any of those, if an article mentions all three of those words, we tag it as uh, about policy on economic policy uncertainty. We then sum the number of articles each month. Why do we do that? It turns out newspapers, kind of put this up here as a prompt, newspapers article, the length of a newspaper goes up and down over time in relation to paper prices. So when paper's expensive, newspapers get short. When it's cheap, they go. So you want to normalize it. Uh, and this is what we get. So this is our US-based economic policy uncertainty index. I showed it back to 1985. That's when we have all 10 of these newspapers. I'll show you a historical series in a bit. But a bunch of these papers we can't get back uh, before the early 80s. So what do you see? We've normalized it to 100 back up until the beginning of 2010. So you see early on things like Black Monday. This was a big stock market crash. There was actually a lot of discussion right afterwards in terms of regulating stock markets. The SEC in the US thought, do we need stock? That was, the, by the way, the, the biggest stock market drop in history. So the stock markets fell by 20% on that one day. The second biggest drop ever of the US stock markets was in 2008, and it was 11%. So that was like an astro, you know, 20% drop was just an enormous number. It was blamed on a well, no one's quite sure, sure what it was, but it was blamed a lot of it on like algorithmic trading. So there's a lot of discussion about introducing reforms, obviously various elections. Uh, I started working on policy uncertainty around this era just because in the US there was a huge surge around Lehman's, the, the crisis with uh, Lehman's and particularly top. So I don't know if you remember back with those discussions about spending, you know, numbers I'd never heard before, trillions of dollars on rejuvenating the economy with very sketchy policy support and a lot of policy uncertainty around it. And then more recently, you see Brexit and Trump. So that's newspapers. Uh, the nice thing about using newspapers to search to measure uncertainty, or in fact, gently, I mean, I like the idea we use it to measure happiness, again, for pretty much anything, is it's very flexible. So if you want to say we want to look at policy uncertainty around, say, defense policy, we just require it contains one of a list of words on defense or healthcare, one of a list of words on healthcare. And for, again, this is US, but here's our defense index, which is a sub index of overall. And you notice it spikes around you know, the Gulf Wars, 9 11. Here's healthcare, a bit around Hillary Clinton's initiative, and then particularly around the Affordable Care Act. We can also go back in history. So newspapers go back. I actually was looking at the physical hard copies in Stanford. They standingly have some of them back to like the early 1900s. Back then, they, they basically, newspapers go up over time in uh, multiple editions of four pages because they basically, in the early ones, only had eight pages because you took two sheets, printed it, and folded it in the middle. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages. But they still have a lot of the newspapers that are around now or around back in the early 1900s. So you can generate time series of policy uncertainty, again, by scraping these papers all the way back to the 1900s. You see events like the Gold Standard Act of the assassination of McKinley, the president. A couple of things in the US context. One is the Great Depression. So stock markets were incredibly volatile in the Great Depression, much more than they were even in 2008. So markets are uh, regularly going up by 2 3% a day. You also see newspapers are full of lots of discussion of policy uncertainty in the US. So I don't even remember Hoover, uh, after whom the Hoover Tower is named in Stanford, uh, basically initially was relatively inactive. In fact, coming back to the value of data, the, you know, the kind of uh, uh, the view of Hoover to some extent, his data was just terrible. He, before we had proper national accounts in the US, he didn't really know the Great Depression was happening. Towards the end of his tenure, he did, but he lost the election. FDR came in and started to be a lot more interventionist. 
The other thing that's kind of interesting in the US context, um, you know, the, the morning session is kind of interesting. I don't know what to what's done. This seems Leicester in the UK, actually, is there's been a big increase, a secular increase as we measure it of policy uncertainty going back to the 60s. Over the same time, US political scientists are pointing out there's been a big increase in political polarization. So there's various measures of where Democrats and Republicans vote or where funding is coming from. And there's, uh, I'm blanking the name of it, there's a well-known Princeton-based political polarization index. And whereas there is the kind of the post-war consensus in the 60s, po politicians in the US are relatively close together. By now, Democrats and Republicans in the US are extremely far apart and almost never agree. And to some extent, this is you know, one of the drivers, I think, for increasing political uncertainty in the US. What about the UK? So for the UK, we use 10 US, 10, sorry, 10 UK newspapers. Again, you probably recognize pretty much all of them. We include the Sun, of course. You know, uh, we want the, you know, the, the 10 uh, you know, highest uh, circulation newspapers. Here's the UK index. We just plotted it back to 97. You can see there's a huge spike for Brexit. Uh, interestingly enough, and I'll come back to this early, later on good and bad sides of measuring uh, uncertainty. You notice the biggest spike for Brexit uncertainty is just around the vote in June 2016. So this is when newspapers had the most coverage of it. There's a couple of later spikes. One was around uh, kind of the Salzburg collapse when uh, Theresa May's deal was rejected. And then later on, it's running up to the March 2019 uh, deadline that obviously came to pass. So that's the UK index. Brexit in 2016 is, is the biggest spike we have. Um, here's the European index. Europe looks similar. Europe, unlike the US, seems to have more of a kind of ongoing rumbling issue. The US has a big surge for the, with, the, with the crash of 08, 09 and seems to recover a bit. The Europe has kind of ongoing more structural reforms and in fact policy uncertainty across the US, across Europe seems to have been kind of rising if anything. Here's uh, Japan, here's India, basically any countries you can have free newspapers for which you can have search them online, you can get a good index. That, do, that doesn't cover every country. So here's North Korea. Uh, you know, we, we have no newspapers for North Korea, so I don't think we can say anything about it. But you know, as long as you have text to search and you can trust it. We have some stuff for China. It's less, you know, I'm not going to get into that. I'm happy to take questions on which newspapers you think are kind of uh, uh, balanced and unbalanced. So the Economic Policy and Uncertainty Index has been used a lot by government. We gave a presentation to the heads of all the central banks, like uh, Carney and Yellen and Draghi, et cetera. It's on Fred. So to summarize, for newspapers as a measure of uncertainty, the pros are, again, it's daily. We have newspapers that come out every day, so you can generate a daily real-time index. We can map it, very much linked to Dan, back in time, so you can generate an index today of anything you want, but for us, uncertainty back to 1900, and you can break it down nicely into subcategories. The problem is it uses newspapers, obviously, so you worry about bias. Maybe, you know, Rupert Murdoch controls a bunch of them. Is he controlling what's written? Possibly. I, again, I can happy to discuss it later. You know, much like all of the previous discussions, there's a lot of papers underlying this. I wasn't going to go into the details. The other thing I think is actually potentially more problematic is it focuses on interesting events. So we're all totally bored of Brexit. So I'll show you another measure of Brexit uncertainty, which is going up. The newspapers go down. And I think the newspapers go down as everyone's just sick and tired of Brexit. And you know, you have to do, it's a bit like Trump. Trump has to make more and more extreme comments or you know, more and more vicious things and more and more outrageous slander to actually get in the paper. It's like you know, Love Island or something. It's just, it's just escalating all the time. Um, and then finally, surveys. Um, so there's two surveys I'm going to talk about. One is the decision maker panel which is a bank, uh, Nottingham University, Stanford uh, project. And the other is a what, which has been going on, and I'll talk mostly about that. And the other is I'll briefly mention with the ONS and ESCO. Uh, I mean, it's great. The ONS has been fantastic. I don't know if anyone here is from the, are there any ONS people here? ONS. Okay, great. You know, stand up and, uh, uh, <laughs> this is like Jerry Springer or something, I guess. <laughs> uh, I actually have a gift in my pocket, but you know. I wasn't necessarily going to give it to the ONS person, but here's my. I'll, I'll come back to that later. But um, we did a one off so survey with the ONS to collect data on management and uncertainty. I'm not going to really go through this, but they've been great, really good to work with. Um, and this is funded by the ESRC. I know France is in the back. I know that you know, Paul is here. The ESRC has been it's like really great at supporting this research, and I know the ESRC has supported CAGE, so uh, we're, we're very grateful for that. So the decision maker panel.
uh, is a collaboration between three institutions. There's the bank, particularly Paul Meesen and Pavel Smiatanka, who have uh, been working on along with Greg Thates and Jenny Lamb. Uh, Nottingham University is, uh, sorry, uh, Phil Bunham. So Nottingham University is Paul Meesen, and then Scarlett Chen and myself at Stanford. What's the genesis of this? Basically, after the Brexit vote, uh, we decided to try and set up a monthly survey of British businesses. So in the US, there's something called the Survey of Businesses Uncertainty run out of the Atlanta Fed, which is part of the Federal Reserve <laughs> System I've been involved in. And we basically replicated that in the UK. So we piloted it in July and August 2016. And September 2016, we started to randomly sample the entire population of UK businesses with 10 or more employees. There's about 50,000 of them. By, we have a, a call center up there um, that's based in Nottingham. We give out various gifts. There's the mug. There's the charges. This is, this is why I brought this along. So basically, people who take part in the survey sporadically give them out gifts. It's much easier than sending them cash. We now have about 8,000 firms and about 3,000 firms respond each month. So this is by far the largest you know, monthly survey in the UK. Uh, and as I explained in a bit, it's used a lot by the bank, HMT Bays, I believe. I, I, don't, I think it's rapidly being used. The bank definitely uses it massively internally. So what do we do? We send out each month about an internet, uh, an email with a survey uh, to people we phoned up and recruited. And if they don't respond for two or three months, we phone them back up and try and get, reactivate them. Most of the people that are responding are either CEOs or CFOs. It's literally called the decision maker panel. You should think of this as kind of the typical firm here has 30 employees. It's not like massive companies. We do randomly sample because the size distribution is very left skewed. You know, the median firm in our sample is kind of 25, 50 employees. So what do we find? Uh, so I'm breaching Gus's rule not to talk about B, but uh, we, you know, there's, there's three stylized facts we find. One is uh, this Brexit, having worked on uncertainty for a while, Brexit is like interestingly multifaceted. So one of the things is there's huge uncertainty over when and even what will happen. So we've asked twice, and we're rolling out another question now, which is when do you expect the UK to leave the EU? We have a number of boxes we allow them to fill out. And you can see this tremendous uncertainty you know, continuing, and we're about to re-roll this out over when, if ever, leave the EU. And it's still not obvious to me, I guess, as many people exactly what will happen. The second for businesses is what the impact of Brexit will be. Again, it's pretty pervasive. We asked them about, is it the major source of uncertainty or one of the top three for various things? Demand, labor, supply chains, regulation, customs. In all cases, it seems to be important. So it's affecting businesses in multiple ways. The third thing is we have what's now our kind of headline index, the Brexit Uncertainty Index, which is we asked firms uh, what, what, how important is Brexit for uncertainty? Not at all. Minor, one of the top three drivers or your top driver. And we add the top two categories together. And what share of businesses tell us that Brexit is one of the three biggest sources of uncertainty facing them. Now, we only started this uh, basically in late 2016. So we don't have any predate. Almost certainly the predate would have been a lot lower since people didn't expect it would happen. One of the interesting things from the survey is Brexit uncertainty was a big deal already after the vote. Around a third of businesses said it was one of the top three factors driving it. You notice it shows a huge spike up in summer 2018 after the Salzburg refusal. Basically, the European Union says they effectively it looked like a big increase in the likelihood of no deal. So at this point, no deal is looking you know, potentially likely. It jumps up. It rises dramatically up until it peaks around March 2019, which is obviously when there's the likely exit date. And then since that, it's kind of dropped back down again. So the survey evidence here is extremely useful. Um, and it's strikingly quite different from what you get from newspapers or stock markets. So blue is stock market volatility for the UK. And you notice stock market volatility actually since the Brexit vote has been low. In fact, 2017 was one of the lowest recordings in you know, recent years. So much the stock markets are a great measure in many ways for uncertainty. They appear for things like Brexit, basically long-running big structure reforms, not to be particularly effective. My guess is for other things like you know, the fall of the uh, Eastern Europe or for major trade reforms, they similarly just may not be good measures of uncertainty. Then in green, as news, does a better job uh, spikes around here, but I suspect this is just the boredom factor. It's just hard to keep running articles. So while businesses are uncertain, it's moved a bit off the front pages. It spiked in March. It spiked around Salzburg. But overall, it's dropped back down again. So 
as a kind of how-to guide, surveys, I think the pros of actually directly asking people about, about uncertainty is accuracy. You really get the direct information from, from what we're doing. We're actually asking CFOs primarily, CEOs. And they tell you it's a relatively easy thing to ask. And so I think we get something that's accurate. The other thing that's turned out to be useful is very flexible. So the MPC, for example, in the um, beginning of this year, wanted to know the impact of stock building. So everyone's concerned there was massive stock building running up to the uh, March 2019. So we just rapidly put a question and you roll it out to the field. It takes a month. You get the data back. We can feed it out in, in February. So they're very, you know, they're accurate and flexible. The, the cons is they're expensive. So we should thank the ESRC for, you know, helping to finance it. And the other thing that's kind of obvious, and it, it was very interesting, it linked to uh, uh, what Andrew and Dan were talking about on the, ha on the happiness stuff and, and Gus was, um, it's hard to build historical data. So much like you mentioned the ONS, you start a survey up and running and it just takes time to accumulate it. But over time, you get a, a lot of history. So, you know, we've been running this now for th three years and just over time, hopefully we'll build up more data. The other thing that's interesting is going to relate a bit to the panel is it looks like Brexit's reduced uh, UK productivity, and it's done it in, in a couple of ways. And this is, I'm just showing you tables, I'm not going to go through the details, but for the underlying academic paper to uh, try and convince you I'm not just randomly asserting something, but <laughs> there's some underlying data. So the first thing is um, a direct effect reducing productivity of each firm in the, in the UK, and which is in the top half. You can either just look at how uncertain you are in future productivity growth, or you can instrument uncertainty with your exposure. So you look at your exposure before the Brexit decision as kind of an exogenous driver, and look at how much that predicts future productivity growth, and the answer is pretty negatively. Why might that be? Well, from the DMP, one of the things we've been asking about is how much time CEOs and CFOs and other key managers are spending discussing Brexit, or how much actual resources in terms of pounds are spent preparing for it? And the answers are pretty big. Uh, you know, there's about 15% of CEOs and CFOs are spending very considerably, you know, about, I think it was, you know, 10 or more hours they claimed a month dealing with Brexit. So not surprisingly, if you're taking a large amount of inputs into production out to plan for Brexit, you're going to reduce productivity. So that's a within firm effect that's just literally reducing each firm's productivity. The other thing you pick up is a misallocation of what's called in the literature between firm effect. So maybe not surprising if you step back and think about it, the most productive firms in the UK tend to be the most open. So firms that are trading, and obviously trading with Europe, that are affected by European regulations, that often have higher migrants, tend to be more productive. They're also the firms that are most hit. So we're effectively shrinking relatively more productive firms relative to less productive firms. So this is, you know, the misallocation. This also seems to be important. So collectively, Brexit looks like it's maybe Brexit uncertainty shrinking, uh, you know, UK productivity by, it's hard to be exact on magnitudes, but, you know, one, two, three, four percent maybe. Um, so again, we've, you know, I, I haven't got, there's, there's various things online and there's some articles, uh, but I wasn't going to go through the details now. So finally, here's the ONS. Uh, you know, I guess today it's like thanking not just the ESC, but the ONS. So the ONS put out something called the Management Expectations Survey that went out in 20, I'm not sure, 2017, 2018. But anyway, this is 2017. So we've been analyzing that data. It's a joint piece with ESCO. I know Rebecca is talking later today. Um, again, it's collecting very detailed expectations data for about 25,000 British firms, which is I, 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 measures of uncertainty, but I'm not going to cover that now. So finally, uh, so just about, I talked about measuring uncertainty. The other topic that's pretty clear is policy is driving uncertainty. Uh, again, it's not surprising. I'll just show you one piece of data on that. So again, using text search for a slightly different set of co-authors, we've been trying to replicate, use newspapers to explain stock market volatility. So it turns out you can replicate stock market volatility searching newspapers. And then the question is, if you look at the articles that mention stock market, discuss stock market volatility, what share of them discuss policy? And this is this graph on the y-axis. So this is the share of newspaper articles discussing stock market volatility that also discuss policy. And one of the things you see is there seems to be an upward trend. Uh, so Basically, politics seems to play an increasingly important role in driving stock markets and I think economics more generally. And again, you know, come back to Cage's motivation for being interdisciplinary. And repeatedly, you've heard the connection with political scientists. I think this is really important. And in fact, something I noticed from Stanford is 
political science undergrad majors has seen a huge explosion. And so it's, you know, for a while it's been flat. The last two or three years, political science has really taken off because businesses want to hire people with political science training because politics is driving much more business and lobbying. And that's something Mirko has worked on. So here you see you know, around a third of articles, a bit over a third of newspaper articles discussing stock market vol. Back in the 80s, talked about politics. By now, it's about a half. And you know, again, this is probably not surprising, but it's a nice way to measure this. So to summarize, uh, I think uncertainty is a major issue. Uh, increasingness is driven by politics. Uh, but measuring uncertainty is hard. Uh, unfortunately, there's no administrative data. Paul and I were talking. You know, I, uh, a lot in the US and the ESRC in the UK has been focused much more on building big data sets, which I'm totally on board with. You know, uncertainty is harder to do. There just isn't anything in administrative data on it, which is why I think the focus is on being more creative. Surveys, I think, is important. It's just expensive and takes time. The other thing is, you know, newspapers, text the data or stock market volatility. And finally, uh, just in the UK context, I think Brexit uncertainty in particular is problematic. And I know we're going to talk about productivity later today. I think it's a key driver of what's happening maybe now and for the next two, three years. That's it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>